So if you would, take your Bibles out. We're going to jump in kind of to part two of where we um, camped out last week and, and, and focus more on one particular part of this thing that we call creating space. Now, your homework assignment was to try to build in some boundary or margin into your life, whatever that looked like in your schedule or in your culture and your time with your family, to build in some margin, to build in some space, not for the purpose of just not doing anything, but for the purpose of relying on God and knowing that all of our strength, all of our hope, all of our peace come from Jesus Christ. And so I hope that you did that. But experience has told me in my past 28 years of ministry that when I just mentioned that, 90% of you went, oh yeah, I was supposed to do that. Um, and that's okay, so you don't get a break, but I'm going to extend the assignment for one week. Um, so you get a chance to try to do that this week, and then we'll grade you on it next week. I, in, in trying not to be a hypocrite, um, tried to do that this week, because one of the things I don't want to do is tell you what God's Word says, and then me do something totally different. So I tried to build in, in my world, what was some boundary and margin and it, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, but in creating that space, I got more done this week than I have in a long time. But it was a struggle. It was not easy. There was time where I would force myself to stop working, whether that be with my job or at home or even with the kids or with the wife or with anything, and, and focus that, that small amount of time on God the Father, on Jesus Christ, on my salvation, on his love for me. And the whole time, it was just nearly impossible not to think in this hour that I've carved out, I could be doing so much. I could get this done or I could get this done. There's an amazing peace that happens when we create space in our life to do that. One of the things that we're going to find interesting today um, in our study is that God designed us as people to do things differently than everyone else. So back in the day, if you remember back in the Old Testament, the people of God were, were doing and starting a part of a religion that was so different from everybody else. They had one God, um, they, they, they worshiped one single being, God the Father. And what was most significant was that every other religion if you wanted to encounter God or whatever God they worship, you went to a temple and then at that temple, you made your intercession to God wherever he was, not God the Father, not Yahweh, but whatever being they were worshiping. And if your actions were good enough, then that God would be pleased by you and would give you blessings. Well, the Israelites, the, the children of God had something totally different. God didn't tell the people to go to the temple to worship him some far off place. They, they orchestrated this thing called the tabernacle, which literally means the dwelling place of God. So that you could have a relationship with Yahweh, with God, because he came down to us. And what was the, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is that when we get to Jesus we read the verse that John says where he says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the Greek, that literally means the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So in the New Testament, the spirit of God was walking through the streets of Jerusalem. And then we, we go to the cross and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now the spirit of God, the presence of God dwells within us every day, all day. So if you look back to Moses and Joshua and those people, they would look at us in, in 2022 and say, man, can you imagine being in a situation where you had the Spirit of God with you all the time? And, and they would look at us as so lucky and so fortunate, whereas we look back on the Old Testament and say, oh, can you imagine how amazing it must have been to, to see the presence of God in the tabernacle, to which they would say, yeah, but it's kind of dangerous, right? Because sometimes you kind of roll the dice. A lot of people died in the Old Testament because their hearts weren't right in the tabernacle, whereas we have something totally different because of Jesus. And, and it's, it's an amazing progression of needing God the Father in our life and needing God to do things. So when you go through the Word of God, um, one of the things that, you're, that we're going to see 
Throughout the book of Psalms, you see this word selah or selah, depending on where you studied. It's, it's, this, it's in the Psalms, frequently David would, would mention this and it would be written in certain Psalms. Sometimes it was just kind of in manuscripts as notes. But this word that you come across in Psalms, selah, S-E-L-A-H, literally means to rest or to pause or to wait. And it was frequently used in, in musical contexts um, where you would rest. And, and it wasn't just a full stop and we're done. Most of the time it would mean there's a rest, there's a pause because something greater is coming. And we don't have time to dig into this. Um, maybe some year we'll do a, a series on the tabernacle in the Old Testament and how it points to Jesus Christ. But, but there was always this, this rest, this full reliance on God because something greater is coming. And for the children of Israel, that something greater was Jesus. And for the people in the New Testament, that something greater was the Holy Spirit. And then for us in our present day, that something greater is eternal fellowship with God in heaven. So this word selah means stop what you're doing, pause for a second, rest, realize our focus on God because something greater is coming. So last week when we talked about creating boundaries and created space, we, we hinted on this passage because of its important, um, but what, we don't want to get caught too much in semantics of what the word means, but for us, what does it mean? What does it mean to rest? What does it mean to pause? What does that look like in 2022? What does that look like post-resurrection? Um, let me just say this. Frequently, I say some things that um, if you didn't watch other series, it can get a little bit confusing, but but, but the way I view the Bible, there's this New Testament way of life that I believe we should start out with. Um, I, I've told you for years I'm going to write the KGV, which is the King Greg version, um, just because it's got a good ring to it. Um, I can't get anybody to sponsor it, though, so I only need like 20 bucks. I mean, that's, that's pretty much all it's worth. Um, but in my Bible, I'd put the New Testament first. Um, and then put the Old Testament at the end so that once you have a, a view of the love, and the grace, and the mercy of Jesus, and the salvation found through him, through his, his shed blood on the cross, once you have a good understanding of that, then let's go back to the Old Testament and, and figure out how we got there. As opposed to starting with creation and sin and disaster that unfolds for the, basically the entirety of old, the Old Testament. If you remember a few months ago, we talked about parenting. And we said, there's really no good example of a good parent in the Bible other than God himself. Um, pretty much every parent really messed it up. And so that's why I'm like, I could be a biblical character um, because I, I have totally jacked up my kids, except for maybe Paisley. We may do Paisley right. Um, but my, my three boys, I just messed them up. And so I, maybe I've learned. But, but the Old Testament, is just, it's just messy. Um, but it points to something. And I believe the Old Testament was created to show you God loving and claiming his people, and it was messy, and it was ugly, and it, it was just disastrous because it was pointing to something that would forever be perfect. And that is the New Testament, and that is the end time spending eternity with God the Father. So we're going to dive into to part of that, uh, one of these little commandments. What's interesting is um, this is probably the most misunderstood commandment in the entire Bible. By far. So if you're taking notes, um, if you have a worship guide, there's a, there's a fill in the blank in there. I want you to kind of follow along. Um, some of these verses, there's like two of them I'm going to read that aren't going to be on the screen. They're not in your notes. Uh, I just I kind of added them later in the week. But I want you to see them. And there's a, if you have a Bible app, that's great. Or there's a hardback Bible um, underneath the seat in front of you. I want you to see that I'm kind of not making this stuff up because it's, it's that significant. So let me just tell you, the people of Israel were slaves for 400 years. It's a long time. That's longer than the United States has even been a country. And um, that's all they knew was slavery. God freed them. Now they're in the wilderness on their way to the promised land where everything is perfect. But then God said, hey, before we get there, 
Let's start living like we're already there. Let's start living like we're in the promised land, which is an incredible foreshadowing for us. It basically says, even though we're not in eternal glory with God the Father, let's start living like we are. Let's start living like we're going to be in eternity. And God decided, hey, since you've been slaves forever, you probably need some rules. So let me give you just, just a few rules to, to bring you up to speed. So this isn't in your notes, this part, but it's Exodus chapter 20, um, the Ten Commandments. And God spoke these words, and he said, Remember, I'm the Lord your God that brought you up out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So here's the first one. You should have no other gods before me. To which they probably would have replied, Well, duh, because you saved us. We had no idea about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Generations had gone by. We hadn't even heard anything, and we, we wouldn't have any other gods. So that's the first one, right? That's the most important. The second one, um, you should not make for yourself any carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in earth beneath um, or water under the earth. You should not bow down to serve them, for I am the Lord your God, a jealous God, visiting iniquities of the Father of sins, on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Let me just be honest. Um, basically, he's talking about don't create any image that you worship. And while he's saying that, what are the people doing? They're creating a golden calf to worship while he's giving that. Um, and then he talks about the, the sins and the judgment on the third and fourth generation. I don't understand intergenerational sin, and I just don't understand how that works. I do understand how intergenerational sin um, works with consequences because some of you are suffering the consequences of generational sin in the past and you've been living your life through it. So, so first, don't have any other gods before God. Second, don't, don't worship anything other than God himself. Don't create any idols, not just golden calves, but don't, don't make your job an idol. Don't make your 401k an idol. Don't make your, your college um, education an idol. Don't make your kids an idol. Worship nothing other than the Lord. These are major ones. Um, the third one, uh, you shall not take the Lord, your God's name in vain. Um, I don't think that means just saying God and then a bad word after it. I think that just waters that down. I think it's so much bigger. Don't leverage God for something that you want um, when God's not a part of that. We don't have time to dive into that. Uh, we did, you know, a couple of years ago, we talked about these commandments, but, but these are three major commandments. And then he gets to the fourth one, and it's the one commandment that I guarantee you've never felt bad about breaking. <laughs> Not only that, but sometimes it's celebrated when you break it. You can get a raise at your job when you break this next commandment. You just show up and you don't need to be at work. You, your boss is all happy and you can get a raise. I guarantee your boss is, let me read you the commandment and then we'll talk about it. Um, number eight, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall do all your work, but on the seventh is the Sabbath unto the Lord. I guarantee your boss has never told you, hey, if you show up on Saturday or Sunday, I'm going to fire you, right? Uh, uh, maybe it, in some jobs they do, but most they would know it's celebrated. Hey, boss man, I just came in to do a little bit of extra work. You don't have to pay me for it. I just wanted to help the company get ahead, right? That's celebrated. It's never punished. And so of these top four commandments, taking a day and remembering that the Sabbath is holy is one of those top four. And then after that, he gets into, um, oh yeah, and by the way, don't kill anybody and don't commit adultery and, and don't steal and don't covet and don't lie and all of those things. But those top four are significant. We're going to talk a little bit about the fourth and, and its significance because here's our problem. My problem and your problem and humanity's problem since day one has always been built around self-reliance. Do it yourself. If, if you can make yourself become better, then all of the things you do in life will be better because you are reliant on you. And we teach that to our kids from the very beginning. Back in high school, I used to 
teach um, swimming lessons for years and years for little kids. And so now I have a five-year-old who's kind of learning how to swim. And we were in this little above ground pool we have in our yard and, and kids are swimming. And she usually swims with her older brothers and they really don't have a, a concept of, of how to teach a kid to swim. They just throw her in and there's a lot of tears and snot and it's kind of a messy thing. Well, they all went out of town. So the first time in my life I got you know a week alone with just her to teach and to do things and she was doing so well. And what I said time and time again is you can do it. You do it by yourself this time. And, and so we kind of, and that's a good thing for a lot of deals, but we're building in self-reliance. And, and that in and of itself is not a bad thing until you get to our age where you start to think if something needs to be done, I'm the only one that can do it. Oh, yeah. And I worship God as opposed to everything good and honorable and worthy and loving comes from God, and I am playing his plan for my life. So that whole issue of self-reliance just fights directly against this fourth commandment of taking a day of Sabbath, of taking time to pull back and realize. So we're going to dive into what that means and dive into what that means post-resurrection, because I think that may be kind of a switch for, for some of us, and I, I hope maybe you, we can learn something today about what the Word of God says. So if you're taking notes, um, I want you to write this down. First off, the law of the Sabbath itself is clear. Really not, not much confusion on what God says we should do on the Sabbath. I'm going to read a couple of verses. This first one's not in your notes, but it just kind of wakes us up to the importance of a Sabbath, of, of a day of rest. And then we're going to talk about how Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so what does that mean to us? Um, the first one, which I don't have in your notes, is Exodus 31, verse 12, if you want to read this, because this is interesting. Um, and the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, here's what, here's what I want you to tell the people of Israel, above all you should keep my Sabbaths. Okay, pause. Most of you, if you've done your read the Bible through in a year, you got to Exodus. If not, bro, you need to really step your game up because that's only like one book you finished. You failed miserably. Uh, most people bow out around, you know, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, those kind of things. Everyone makes it to Exodus because you're in Exodus like January 20th. If you haven't kept your New Year's resolution through January 20th, man, get some help. Get a friend or something. That, that's bad. So when you're reading this, you should go, wait, above all? Ab above all, keep the Sabbath holy? Because what you just told us a few chapters ago was don't kill anybody and don't steal and don't lie and don't, don't covet. I mean, yeah, those are all those important. But before you do that, keep the Sabbath so not that this is how God works, but, but you know, if you kill someone, that's fine. You know, if you have a few affairs, really no big deal. Murder, eh, you know, slavery, all this kind of stuff, eh, not that big of a deal. But don't miss the Sabbath. That, that seems bizarre to us. Imagine telling your children, you know, hey, I don't want you to, um, when you're swimming with your friends, um, don't drown them right? Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're in school, don't like run away and be gone for three or four weeks. Um, don't set the neighbor's house on fire. All those things are important, but here's the most important. You have to eat your peas. I don't really care if you do all that stuff because we can deal with that, but you have to eat your peas. You'd be like, that doesn't make sense. When you're reading this, it almost doesn't make sense until you realize the significant of why God is doing that. I can't talk about eating peas without telling a story of, of Nathan, um, my middle son on the keyboard. Uh, he was our, like, he, it wasn't that he didn't want to eat food, but it was a power struggle. Um, and so we would make them eat, they didn't have to clean their plates, but they had to try everything. And I forgot what it was, green beans or something, and he just wouldn't do it. And so we did the thing where we're like, well, you're not getting up from the table until you do. And he's like, well, fine, I'm going to get married at this table because I ain't doing it. 
And I, I legitimately think it was like five hours homeboy sat at the table um, until we finally gave up. You know, we're finally like, just, just go. And he looked at me. He's like, boom, got you, old man. Uh, no, he didn't say that. <laughs> but in, in my heart, that's kind of what I was feeling uh, because he, he just he pushed it. But how ridiculous is that for all of these are important, but above all, literally above all, you shall keep my Sabbath for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. So it's not just, we're not just taking time off to be lazy. We're taking time off to realize that in that time off, that God is the one who saves us, that God is the one who sanctifies us, that God is the one to give us every one of our needs. I got, I got to read the next verse. I don't even have it here in my notes, but it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, so he's telling us how significant this is. That's in um, Exodus 31, verse 12, um, that I may sanctify you. Verse 14 says, you shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. If you don't have a Bible, you need to read this because you're not going to believe it. And by the way, everyone who profanes it, you should die. We're going to kill you. What? I mean, so I can murder someone and spend time in jail, but if I miss the Sabbath, you're going to be put to death? Okay, do you feel the weight of that? And so when we're reading this through, we cannot just skim through this in the Bible without saying, what is so incredibly significant that first off, it's above all, and second off, if you don't do it, you're going to die. Now, this is one of those separations, I believe, of Old Testament law that Jesus came to fulfill, and we live under grace and mercy. And so I'm not going to kill you if you don't take a Sabbath, but the weight of why God did it has not changed. And, and we want to dive in just a little bit to that. So um, jump back to our notes, Exodus chapter 20. This is where he kind of unpacks it for us. We'll read through it, and then we'll kind of take it apart. Um, Six days, he says, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Six, oh, I think I have this here. Um, six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath unto the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Six days you shall gather it, and on the seventh, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. So we're going we're gonna to look at what happened with, with manna in the wilderness and how significant this is. Before you tune me out and you say, yeah, well, my work is different. Realize that this was a 24-7 culture like we talked about last week. Babies had to eat. Old people had to be fed. And if we didn't work on a day, that stuff didn't happen. So before we tune it out, look at the context with which this is written. Two million people coming out of slavery, two million-ish, we're not sure the exact number, Coming out of slavery, getting ready to go into the promised land, God says, let's live like we're already in the promised land. I want you to work for six days and then take a day of Sabbath. They're like, well, what are we going to eat? And so God provided manna, which is just a fascinating story in the Bible. One morning they woke up and they, they looked out of their tents and there's this stuff. I, I think it was white, but there's just this white piles of stuff all over the ground and and, and wife said, hey, honey, look what's outside of our tent. And, and the guy goes and looks outside the tent. Well, the word manna literally means what is it? So, so he's like, look at that, honey. And the husband goes, manna. And the wife's like, I don't know. <laughs> right? And, and, so, and so one of the teenage boys was like, let's eat it. You know, because of a pile of junk on the ground. Why not eat it? I'm like, man, this is pretty good. So for 40 years, they did this every single morning God would provide, but he didn't do it seven days a week. He only did it six days a week. And what was interesting is you can't collect the manna and save it until the next day because it wouldn't be any good the next day. Why? Why? Because that's self-reliance. Because God knew someone's going to say, hey, if I were to take some Freon, and the guy's like, what's Freon? He's like, I don't know, it won't be discovered for a few thousand years. But if I took some Freon and I circled it through these coils and I cooled down this box, I could save all this manna and we could have enough manna that we could sell it and we could keep it and all that. And God would say, nope, it's not going to work. It's going to go bad. Because the next morning, I'm going to provide. 
Every morning when you wake up, before you ever look outside your tent, there's going to be this anxious, um, kind of exciting feeling that, did God provide again? Did, did God come through one more time? And sure enough, you open the tents and there was manna. And they, 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 they lived on it. The first few months, maybe, the most amazing thing in the world. And then you find a few years later, they get sick of it. They, they almost to the point where like, man, back in Egypt, we, we occasionally got some scraps from our master's table, but all we're eating is manna. We've had manna bread. We've had manna pudding. We've had banana. We just, everything is manna. And they kind of got sick of it. And they, <laughs> that's my favorite joke in, in Bible life. Um, and they even got to the point where they're like, yeah, God provided, but we're tired of it. Do you see how we as a people can do the exact same thing? God has given us so much grace, but after so much time goes by, we get used to it. That's why I love baptism and, and the the celebration of someone coming to faith in Christ because they're so excited. Because for the first time, they're realizing that their sins are forgiven, that they'll spend an eternity with God the Father, and they're going to spend the rest of their life living like Jesus. And it always seems to wear off a little bit. It's that same sort of excitement with manna in the Bible that just kind of after a while becomes habit. But it was started by God saying every morning, you rely on me. 2,000 years later, Jesus was trying to teach his disciples how to pray. And he would say, give us this day our daily manna. Just like you did in the wilderness. Every day when we wake up, my reliance is on you. My reliance is not on us. <clears throat> now, most of you in here today are seeing the rub of that. That, that is so countercultural. We've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to provide for our families. We've got to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And all, all that's good. But at what point it supersedes our desire and our realization that God provides everything? We've missed it. And I think you can, you can provide for your family and you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can do all that if every day there's a realization that the only way you can do that is through the power of God himself. And so that's, that's what I want to try to teach us how to live in this, in this process. So um, the law of the Sabbath was clear. And, and hopefully we won't die because we don't keep it. But the law of the Sabbath was extremely clear. So let's go to the next one. Um, the next one, number two, the law of the Sabbath is comprehensive. The law of the Sabbath is comprehensive. It covers just about everything. We hinted on this last week, so we're not going to camp out here. Um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 10 says, uh, on it you should not do any work. And then he even begins to, to quantify this because somebody got smart, like we said last week, and they decided, well, then I'll let my, uh, my kids do it or I'll let my daughter do it, or I'll let my servant do it, or I'll let my livestock, and God says, no, on the day you should not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant, your female servant, your livestock. <laughs> this last one is great because once they got into the promised land, they hired outside people who weren't a part of the children of Israel, and they had them do their work outside the gates on the Sabbath. What a loophole, right? <laughs> God, we got gotcha. you. Because they're not children of Israel, so they're not bound to the covenant. They're not bound to the law. And if we have work outside of the city gates, then we can get our work done. We can be self-reliant, and we can work through this loophole. But then God says, no, not even the sojourner outside of your gates. He's basically saying, I want no one and no thing to do any work. You take a day to remember what God has provided for you. You take a day to remember what God has provided, and as important as everything else is in your life, God is more important. I would love to get to the point where the answer to the question, what's the most important thing of your life, would become the answer of my relationship with God the Father. 
my salvation through Jesus Christ that gives me access to Yahweh, the creator of the universe. But, that, but that's not our go-to. It's our go-to after we think about it for a while. I'm a, uh, I'm a family feud nut. Um, one of these days, I want to play Family Feud because I'll win that mug. I just, I, I just, I'm good at it, I think, sometimes. Um, and so imagine the question we had to ask. 100 people, you know, what, what is the most important thing of your life? I guarantee no matter who you ask, most people, their immediate answer is not going to be my relationship with Jesus Christ. It gives me access to God the Father. Most people are going to say, my family, my wife. You know, my health, my all, and all those things are good. All those things are important. But, but imagine we're playing Family Feud one day, and, and all seven answers are my relationship with Jesus, which gives me access to God the Father. Because, because that's the most important. Outside of that, our toil and our work and our struggle kind of becomes meaningless. And this is not new. This was at the beginning of God establishing a nation among himself. So the law of the Sabbath is comprehensive. Now here's where it changes. The law of the Sabbath grows our confidence. I can testify to this. Those people that you know that have done these types of things, they can testify to this, that the law of the Sabbath helps grow our confidence because God himself did it. If God himself did it, how much more important is it that we do it? Check this out. I don't think any of you have done this. I'm pretty sure. I don't know that any of you have ever created um, a, a planet and a solar system and a civilization. But God says, for six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is within them. So everything you see around you, God made. And, and don't take this lightly. What this also means is all these minuscule, minute molecules that are in your body that make up things. Like we, we thought at one point that the atom, the, the neutron, the proton were the, the smallest things. I don't know what we would call like elements or something. Um, I'm not a scientist totally. But now they're finding, no, they're not. Because there's millions of things that make up those and, and the energy that it takes to create those things. Um, not only that, but the magnitude of the solar system and the stars. I have the coolest thing. If you don't have it and you live in Montana, shame on you. It's, um, I hope it's not a bad like, company. I don't have no idea. But it's an app called Night Sky. And what it is, is it's just like all the constellations and stuff. And so you can be out camping or you can be out somewhere and you can like hold your phone up and like point at different things and it'll tell you, oh, that's Majoris 472.6. And the most important thing is like you can see Starlink satellite 22642 or you can see other satellites and you can like see them going across the sky. It's the coolest thing in the world. The problem is, is that they only give you enough information to buy the $29.99 a year, like premium version. And then it's got like music. I mean, it's the coolest thing in the world. You got to get it. Um, and, and you look up and you think in all of that creation, millions and millions of galaxies and solar systems. And God did that in six days. But the Sabbath was so important that he rested on the seventh and he blessed it. And he made the Sabbath day holy. Why did God rest? Because he was out of energy? No. Because he was tired? No. Because he wanted to take a nap? No. But because it was holy. Because even God himself said, if I'm going to have my people to do this, I'm going to do this. You divide up everything in the world that's created in six days and divide that out, divide it by six now, divide it by seven and see how much more God could have done. But he didn't. Or maybe it was complete in its perfection because he rested on the seventh and he made it holy because just a few chapters later, he's going to ask his people to do the same thing. And in a way that, that grows our, com our confidence with God. So as busy as I think I am, God would say, have you ever created a universe? I'm like, uh, no. Have you ever created land, sea, water? Have you ever created a being that has its own specific God DNA signature that's unique from anyone else on the face of the planet? Well, no. Okay, so, so if you haven't done any of that, you surely haven't done any of that in six days, so are you really that busy? Can you imagine the to-do list of creating something out of nothing in six days? 
Like, because I'm a list guy. Um, I, I, like, love to-do lists. I even, I'll go through my to-do list, and I check it off. And so at the end of the day, I can be like, look at all that I've done. And I'm kind of weird that sometimes if something's not on my list and I do it, I put it on my list just so I can check it off. Anybody else do that? Okay, there's something wrong with you people, right? We, that's, not, that's weird. That is just not okay. But I do it because I, I want to do it. Can you imagine God saying, I know you're busy, but the God of the universe even took a day and rested. So, so it's comprehensive, and it lets us know that we have confidence in the one who did it because it's so extremely important. Now, fast forward to the New Testament, And in the New Testament, we see that every day is holy unto the Lord. And that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And then you start reading in the New Testament and you find out that... that I I worry about saying things sometimes because I don't don't want someone to take just this little clip of the sermon and and miss the whole context, which frequently we do with the Bible. But... um, but Jesus kind of gave us some wiggle room. Jesus, Jesus did some things that the Pharisees should have put him to death, right? There are some times when Jesus violated the law. I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Violated the laws of the Sabbath in the Old Testament for the good of the glory of God for here and evermore. And the church people went ballistic. Okay, full stop. Let me just say kind of understand the Pharisees and the church leaders going ballistic because you told us that if we don't do it, we die. You said that if we want to kill someone, fine. If we want to commit adultery, fine. If we want to steal, fine. But don't miss observing the law of the Sabbath and making it holy. But then Jesus comes. And I think that's one of the most major shifts in the tabernacle no longer being the dwelling place of God where only priests can go, to now the tabernacle being Jesus Christ to where everyone has access. And the law didn't change, but the focus of what was important changed. Here's what didn't change. What didn't change is that we can't be a people driven on self-reliance. We have to be a people that learn to trust what God has given us and find our rest and find our favor in that God provides everything. That God literally gives us every single thing that we need. Um, there's, there's a verse in Luke, I don't know that we, yeah, we'll read it in just a second. Um, let me read this, number four, the law of the Sabbath with Jesus Christ is consecrated, which means it, it, it's holy, it's sealed forevermore but a quick reading with what Jesus did gives us a little bit of wiggle rooms, probably not the right word, but kind of gives us a framework for which to deal with the, the, the fabric of what exactly the Sabbath is. And I'm going to give you some, hopefully, some how-to tips. The law of the Sabbath is consecrated. Look at um, Matthew chapter 11. We read this last week. It's one of my favorite verses. He says, come to me, all who are labor." all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. But rest in the Greek. I I will give you Sabbath. I will give you rest. I will give you that pause. I will give you margin. I will give you the boundaries that you need if and only if you come to Jesus. Why? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and I will give you Um, And you will find rest, you will find Sabbath for your souls. So in the New Testament, it's no longer a law-driven at... Boy, if you were raised um, Seventh-day Adventist or even Hebrew or some of these, it's maybe kind of tough. But now it's no longer a a, a dusk on on Friday night till till dawn and dusk on Saturday night. It's no longer this, this... this time period where Sabbath has to happen. But it's, it's a constant lifestyle, a constant choice, leaning into Jesus, and he will give you that Sabbath if we do it right. Now, um, I feel like I'm kind of leading you out here on a diving board, and we're going to kind of put an exclamation point on this about how to do it. 
But Jesus took the Sabbath and said, I am I'm the law of the Sabbath. I fulfilled that. You will find your rest through Jesus Christ. And it, it grows, it, it's consecrated in that this is something we're always going to deal with forever. Um, he called himself the Sabbath rest and the Pharisees went ballistic. The Pharisees would have, would have just totally freaked out. Um, Matthew chapter 12, look at this. He's talking to the Pharisees after something happened. He says, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Uh, imagine me saying to you, um, something greater than Jesus is available. Many of you, if I were to say that, would get up and walk out. And rightfully so. I would get up and walk out too. In the same way, Jesus said to these people, something greater than this temple, this tabernacle, this dwelling place of God, to which even the holy people would have said, what is this guy talking about? There's nothing greater than the tabernacle. There's nothing greater than the temple. Something greater than the tabernacle is here. And if you would have known what this means, that I desire mercy, not sacrifice, although they had been raised on sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. And then they would have said, why are you talking about you? you something greater than the, the tabernacle is here. And then he said, if you know what this means, I, they would have went, are you, are, you, are you saying that you are greater than the temple? Imagine how furious they would have been. And they were. This was, um, I don't know, what do a sermon series on this too? I got a lot of sermon series. Um, there are four or five things in the New Testament that we see that were kind of tipping points for the Pharisees to where um, after church they had a conversation in the back and they're like, we got to kill this guy. We got to get rid of this joker because it was so contrary to everything they've been taught in the Old Testament, like claiming that you are greater than the entire temple system while standing just outside the temple system. And Jesus is trying to get them to shift to say, yes, Old Testament had a purpose. The Old Testament was inspired and led by God as we were creating a nation. Remember what we said in the beginning, pointing to something. Jesus would have said that that something is me. And I'm here. And they killed him. And, and, and before we are so hard on the Pharisees, I may have responded the same way. I may have called that man heresy and, and walked out the door. But then I may have watched the crucifixion and subsequently the resurrection, and that would have changed my mind, hopefully. But, but it was so different, and Jesus said, there's something greater if you realize that I require mercy, not sacrifice. Here's the deal. What that means now is that if you don't fulfill the law of the Sabbath... God's not going to kill you, right? I mean, I mean, you're like, well, the Old Testament said he would, but he hasn't. Um, how many of you have ever violated the law of the Sabbath? Raise your hand. I'm going to wait for a minute because some of you aren't hand raisers. I'm going to call you out if your hand ain't up because, you're right, of course, all of this. And you have the ability to raise your hand so God did not kill you. So, so Jesus said that, that he requires mercy not sacrifice, that there's, there's a change. And so what, is that, what does that look like um, for us? Now, at this point, um, you would say, uh, then, then why, oh, let me read you the next verse. I just missed it. And then he puts a capstone on it and says, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And then they were like, whoa, 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 Jack, just a couple of chapters ago, you called yourself the Son of Man. He said, yeah, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Another tipping point that would ultimately get them killed. So some of you would say, well, um, why, don't, why do we worship on Sunday as opposed to taking a Sabbath? Why do we come to church? Because quite frankly, Sunday is not my Sabbath. Can't be. It's a work day. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of you that volunteer in your work. And technically, you'd be, you'd be um, disobeying the laws of the Old Testament by doing anything like that on Sunday, but then Jesus totally switches that. Here's why we worship on Sundays, not on Saturdays, not on the Sabbath. And this is the most misunderstood thing in the world. Should we observe a Sabbath day? Absolutely. 
Well, then why do you worship on Sunday? Because we're celebrating the resurrection. Because the resurrection happened on a Sunday, therefore we celebrate in worship with that on a Sunday. It's not that the Sunday is holy. Back then, the Sunday was the start of the week. We, we worship because Jesus rose on the Sunday. And Paul says, if it wasn't for the resurrection, then we're all fools. That everything we believe loses its weight. And so that's, that's simply why we worship on Sunday. Um, and then Paul even says, oh man, this thing blipped out on me again. Paul even says that, uh, don't, don't, don't think that, well, I'm going to have to use Sunday as my Sabbath so I can't um, go to church, right? And I, and I can't do those type of things. And Paul said, wait, no, don't, don't neglect meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another even more as you see the day drawing near. So some of you are, are doomsday people. Okay, let, let's just have a family meeting here real quick. Um, some of you, you, you may watch a little too much news, and that, that's okay if you have time, but um, some of you are doomsday people. Some of you are, are doomsday people, meaning the end of the world is coming. What are we going to do, right? Some of you are doomsday people, and you're like, the end of the world is coming. I'm going to prepare, right? And we call you preppers. Um, and I, don't worry, I'm not going to make you raise your hand because you wouldn't do it anyway. Because you're like, I don't want to want to take my stash of 25 years of rice. I mean, I'm going to raise your hand. <laughs> Some of you are doomsday preppers preparing for it. Now, honestly, think about this. Those of you that are preppers, don't raise your hand because we'll rob your stash. Um, <laughs> those of you that are preppers, there's a part of you in your mind that wants it to happen. And you wouldn't admit it, and you're probably not even shaking your head yes, but in the back of your mind, you're like, yep, you bet because I got guns and I got water for 57 years. And I got rice. I have more salt than you could ever possibly imagine. You kind of want that sort of thing to happen. You want this, this doomsday situation to happen um, and you prepare. And that is the, the key of self-reliance. My hope is, and what is, what is interesting in the prepper community why do I know all this? Because I'm kind of a wannabe prepper, but I, I love comfort. I love it. I, I just love comfort. Um, one of the things that's crazy about this is all you guys have your, your bug out bags, right? I got my bag. If the world falls apart, I'm bugging out. I'm out of here. No, you're not. Now, if you're here and you're single and you have no one else in your life, maybe, but the funniest thing ever, John Lovell has a, um, a video of, of him. He's like, here it is, end of the world. He grabs his bug out bag and he gets ready to head to the door. And there his wife is standing with two kids. She's like, you got our bug out bags? And he's like, oh. You know, and, and, and there's suddenly this relation of, and remember, as we're bugging out, we got to swing by and get your mom and my mom, right? And we got to get Cindy, our, our Aunt Cindy, because she's not feeling well. We, we, you know, and so it's like, wait a minute. I ain't going to bug out. Now they call it get home bags because we have to protect those around us. It's a, it's a self-reliance driven thing that is all based upon you, all based upon what I would do for myself. And I hope as a follower of Jesus Christ that that, that involves helping others, that that involves helping those around you. My kids and I have had this conversation. If it all falls apart, there will be people that show up at our house. Obviously family, but there may be other people. And there, my faith with Jesus Christ runs up against my survival nature of myself. And I hope to goodness that my faith in Jesus Christ wins. Because what did Jesus do? He gave it all away. He gave his life for people that would even reject him. So, um, what, what do we do specifically? Um, if, if you believe that the day is drawing near, if you're one of the preppers, if you're one of the doomsday people, then, then we encourage one another and we assemble together and we encourage and build each other up because that's our only response. So let me, let me show you kind of what I think we do. Um, I don't have this in your, in your Bible. I don't have time to read the whole thing. But when you get home, read Luke chapter 13. Um, it's a, in, well, I'll just, let me tell you. Luke chapter 13, verse 10, starting in verse 10 and down. Jesus heals this woman that had been bent over with some medical condition for like years and years and years. And, and she walked in and he like healed her and she straightened up. 
Okay, imagine if you're there and you see this happen. I mean, that's church, right? I mean, hallelujah, she's healed. There's some Pharisees gathering in the back and they're like, whoa, Jack. I mean, I, I know, Miss Ethel, we've been praying for you for 15 years that you'd be healed of your back, but now's really not the time because it's the Sabbath. So if you want to come back on Monday, we'll heal you. So if you could, Jesus, give her back her hunch over thing and let her come back Monday, then it would be perfect. And Jesus basically says, you hypocrites, you've taken something from the Old Testament and, and it's important and we should do it. And how do we do it is, is also important. But this lady needed to be healed today. And then he said, let me ask you a question. How many of you on the Sabbath untie your donkey and take it to water? They're all like, well, yeah, of course, donkeys have to drink. He's like, yeah, and this woman has to be healed. So Jesus constantly builds in this sort of room for us to do the Sabbath if the reliance is on God. So here's what I want you to do. Maybe for you, it's setting aside a full day of trust and adoration and focus on God the Father. If you're a single mom, that might not be possible. So you don't, you don't get a pass, I don't think, but that you build into specific times every single day of your life where you pause and you make your reliance on God. And if it's part during the week, if it's part during the day, that every day definitely once a week, but every day you wake up and you begin to focus and you say, God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Before I ever get what I want, I want what you want in my life. If you just pray that simple prayer every single morning, I guarantee there will be a revolutionary change. And I'm, man, I'm preaching to myself here. God, I want this. I want this. I need to do this. I need to do this. But before any of that, I want your will to be fulfilled in my life. And then don't just say amen and go on with your day. And a few hours later, say, God, are, are, are we checking with your will? Am, am I doing what your will would have me to do? I, I've learned recently to pray this. I go to meetings with people or I'll, I'll have things throughout the week. And on the way there, I have a lot of time in the car and I love it. And I'm able to say, God, in this meeting, let your will be done. I have thoughts, ideas, and things, but let your will surface in that. The most important time is when I leave church and I go home. I have about a 15-minute drive. Um, it's my time to, to transition myself from pastor to dad so that, I, you know, who knows what I'm going to walk into when you walk in the front door, right? And, and I say, God, I want your will to be done in my family because I can't do it on my own. I can't, there's too many irons in the fire. It's this total reliance on God to build in that if Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, then I, I practice it constantly. Do you need to take time off? Yes. Do you need to take days where you're not working? Yes. I think you need to take weeks where you're not working throughout the year. But it's this total and absolute reliance upon God. One of the greatest things, I don't know if you know this, but... Um, Number one largest, what they would consider fast food restaurant in the world is Starbucks, oddly enough. They don't even really sell food, but that just shows how much we love our coffee. Number two is McDonald's, which we kind of understand that. You know what number three is? Chick-fil-A. Um, and if you know anything about Chick-fil-A, they're only open six days a week. They're closed on Sunday. Why? Because in 1946, when this thing was founded and throughout the years, this guy by the name of S. Stuart Cathy, who started the whole thing, he says, taking the Sabbath is not an option. This is a, con this is a company that brings in $13 billion a year, and they're closed for 52 days out of that year. That could go from $13 billion to $20 billion real quick, and now they could be the largest fast food restaurant in the world. But they don't. Because taking a Sabbath is not an option because it works into their business model. My encouragement to you is find something that works into your model to let your trust and your reliance be on God the Father. And to be honest, starting, I don't even 
I don't even care what it looks like, but it's a focus. It's literally saying, I can do this. And God would say, I know you can. And if you keep doing this, you're going to accomplish great things. But I know what you're capable of, but I don't want you to live there. I want you to pull back just a little bit and focus on me. And it will literally give you rest for your soul. And I believe you'll do greater things because of that. It's this constant realization that every day when I wake up, as the song says, I I run to the Father. That I needed so much that I couldn't do myself. So I, I run to my Heavenly Father. Love the lyrics in the songs where it says, I, I don't have a context for that, for that kind of love. A love that would say, if you don't do it, I'm still going to love you. But if you do it, I'll show you the grace and mercy that you can't imagine. So I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And then I'm going to say a short prayer. And then I want us to sing that, that song as we close today. Um, just, just one more time. And I want you to, to let the words kind of soak in to your life. Let the words kind of build into what you have a constant pursuit of your Heavenly Father. That every morning, God, I, I run to you. And I start at that point where thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and I'm not going to go any further until that happens. Ask your Heavenly Father, God, what would Sabbath look like in my life? What would my total reliance upon you look like in my life? Heavenly Father, give us the grace and the peace and the mercy to do exactly what Jesus did. Show us what that looks like in each and one of our lives and that every morning we wake up, we run to the Father with everything that's in us, We feel your embrace, we feel your comfort, and we feel your mercy. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.